Good morning. Welcome to today's webinar, Food for Thought, What to Consider When Launching Food Halls in Public Markets, brought to you by Connecticut Main Street Center. My name is Kristen Lopez. I'm the Education and Training Director here. And before we jump in today's great program, I have a few words to share. So if you're new to Connecticut Main Street Center, we are the export resource for developing and sustaining vibrant downtowns and main streets that fuel our state's prosperity. Our mission is to assess, educate, convene, and advocate to develop and grow great downtowns. We help Connecticut create the places where people want to live. We assist municipalities, downtown management organizations, small businesses, and property owners to be more knowledgeable. We help communities understand how to bring about incremental and transformative economic development appropriate to their communities. And we highlight and guide de developers towards investment opportunities. We are so grateful to our sponsors and funding partners. Connecticut Main Street's founding sponsors are Eversource and the State of Connecticut Department of Economic and Community Development. Our growth sponsors are Avangrid and Connecticut State Historic Preservation Office. Our educational programs, Main Street Forms for the 21st Century, are sponsored by Webster Bank, Avangrid, and Farmington Bank Community Foundation. Our corporate investors are People's United Bank, Capital for Change, Windsor Federal, and M&T Bank. Connecticut Main Street Center also has important strategic partnerships, including our partnership with H, uh, FHI Studio, our AICP certification maintenance provider. A note to planners, um, this webinar is approved for one CM credit. Some quick housekeeping notes um, before we jump into the program. This webinar will be about an hour. We will stop for questions at the end. So please feel free to type in your questions as we go. We'll go back in the chat and bring those up. And after this webinar, as Judith said, you will receive an evaluation. Um, please take a moment to complete that. It helps us develop So clearly we're having a little technical difficulty, but I believe Kristen will be right back with us. Um, she was just saying again about the, um, yeah, I'm sure she'll be right back on uh, about our evaluation. It really is very helpful if um, you can all fill that out. It is required for planners to get credit. So um, I'll be sending that. I'll actually send that link at the end of this session as well, but it will be in the follow-up email. Um, all of our webinars are on our website, so you can always go back and revisit anything that you um, may have missed. Um, let me just... Hi, Judith. Here she is. I don't know what just happened. <laughs> I, I have no idea. I am so sorry. I just got kicked off all of a sudden. You did, um, but it's not a problem, and we're happy to have you back. Okay. Sorry about that, everyone. Okay, we're all here. We're all collected. I'm collected. Okay. So. <laughs> all right. So I don't know where I got cut off. Um, I think you were just talking about the evaluation. Oh, okay. Okay. So um, great. So um, the, the next part I just wanted to share with everyone is what we believe are components of a vibrant main street, um, which we believe are, are developed around these six components of a unique sense of place economic vitality, community engagement, and policies that support appropriate growth, equitable places and inclusive practices, sustainable practices that protect our natural resources, and a connectivity with a focus on multimodal transit. With that, let's get into today's program. We have two great speakers today who will be speaking about their experience launching and planning for food halls and public markets in Connecticut. We'll hear from Chelsea Mota, Director of Operations at Parkville Market in Hartford, and Jennifer Valentino Rodriguez, Director of Planning and Development at um, Town of Bloomfield, but we'll be speaking from her experience at the Town of Windsor Locks. A quick rundown of, of what to expect for today. So first, we're just going to start off with giving a basic overview between food halls and public markets, some of their key benefits and what they can do for your community, mention a couple resources, and then Chelsea will tell about um, her experience at Parkville Market, and Jennifer will talk about the plans for the public market plans in town of Windsor Locks. And then we'll open it up to Q&A. So again, feel free to type in questions along the way. We'll get to them at the end 
end of the presentation. So what are food halls? A food hall is a cafeteria-like setting where customers can choose from a multiple different vendors and dine in a communal environment. Typically, food halls showcase different varieties of cuisine, highlighting the local communities, ethnicities, and culture, giving customers many options to choose from in the same place. Uh, do not get these confused with food courts. Food halls are not like food courts at all. There are two main distinctions um, between the two. First, food halls do not have fast food chains. Food hall vendors are local, small businesses, usually artisanal and have a unique focus like vegan desserts or authentic ethnic cuisine. Second, food halls are focused on providing an experience. So that's from the fixtures that are used, the space planning that foster people coming together to events and programming that attract visitors. There are two different models for food halls. A multi-concept food hall is when all the dining options are owned and operated by the same vendor. Um, a couple examples of this are Plant City in Rhode Island. Um, that, that's pictured here. It's all plant-based food. All the different um, eating experiences are owned and operated by the same company. And also Italy, if you're more familiar with that um, in New York City and other um, uh, uh, locations around the country with all these Italian different markets are example of a multi-concept food hall. A multi-vendor food hall is when spaces in the food hall are leased out by a variety of different food vendors. Um, Parkville Market, which we'll hear from in a little bit, that's an example of a multi-vendor food hall. Um, and the one pictured here is Urban Space, which is located in New York City, and they also have several different locations. So what are public markets then? So a traditional definition of a public market is one that is uh, owned and operated by municipalities where vendors sell fresh food. Um, however, today's public markets can have a lot of different models in terms of ownerships and vendors. Public markets can be large indoor facilities. Um, they can also be temporary pop-ups like farmer's markets, um, but some key characteristics of public markets are they have public goals um, to benefit the community. The spaces are where the community can access and the vendors are locally owned. So what are some of the types of vendors? So while food halls really focus heavily on prepared foods, public markets can have um, a, a lot more options and, and can be designed for more of a shopping experience and can still include prepared foods. A study done by Project for Public Spaces um, called Estimating the Economic Impact of Public Markets breaks down public market vendors into these four categories. First, um, pro, uh, producers and growers, so that's fruit and vegetable growers, meat producers, poultry, fishermen. Um, second are the non-producers and produce resellers, so that's butchers, bakers, fishmongers. Um, then we have prepared food vendors. And then the other kind of category um, typically are crafts um, in different, you know, handmade items or um, globally sourced, you know, fair trade items as, as well. So Project for Public Spaces is um, really the leading voice in creating public markets and developing market cities. You, if you, once you dive into this space, you will always come back to them. Um, they hold an annual conference and produce a lot of studies and papers on the importance of markets. We'll, in a, in a few moments, share um, their, their site and some key resources that you can access. And over the last two decades of the work, they've identified six key benefits to public markets. So the first is they bring together diverse people with intentional planning. Second, they renew downtowns and neighborhoods by bringing social and economic activity. Third, they link urban and rural economics, especially restoring local food systems. Fourth, they provide economic opportunity. Markets can act as a small business incubator that lower the cost and minimizes the risk of startup businesses. This is especially true for food vendors. 
Fifth, they promote public health through increased access to healthy foods. They can reduce social isolation and can include health and wellness programming. Sixth, they create active public spaces. Starting a food hall or a public market is by no means an easy task, and our two guest speakers will share their experience um, with that. There are a lot of considerations to weigh and develop, uh, including vendor spacing, kitchen requirements, leasing agreements, daily operations, what are the shared resources for vendors, and the recruitment of tenants. Some key resources that I'd like you guys to check out um, are the Project for Public Spaces. They have a training coming up called How to Create Success, uh, Successful Markets. Um, that's an online training program, and today is actually the very last day to sign up for that. So if you are serious in launching a market, suggest that you take that out and perhaps sign up. They also have an annual conference. Um, it's, I believe it's been on pause the last couple of years, um, but the next one will be next year. So um, check that out as well. And another resource um, that we found that was really great, it's a free downloadable from JLL, a large developer that has a lot of experience with food halls and markets. And they have this great free download called So You Want to Build a Food Hall, which has a lot of really great um, kind of questions to ask yourself all the way from branding to the operational side. So just as a quick kind of checklist barometer, that might be a good place for you to start out. So with that, that was a grounding of food halls and public markets. Hopefully that gives you context of what we're talking about because we're going to hear from a food hall and a public market today. And so let me first introduce our first speaker. Chelsea Mota is the Director of Operations for the Parkville Market, Connecticut's first food hall, where she oversees all aspects of market operations, marketing, and business development. She joined the team during 2019 during the construction phase and led the project management leasing and opened the food hall in May 2020. Chelsea, take it away. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here talking about um, a topic I know my family and my friends are exhausted um, of hearing about from me, so I'm excited to talk about it with this group today. Um, so uh, we are um, Connecticut's first food hall. We opened in May of 2020. Um, and when Kim first asked me to speak about how we opened, you know, how we structured things, how the construction process went, I told her, honestly, my presentation will be a lot more of uh, all of the reasons why people told us not to open this market. Um, we, uh, you know, starting in the city of Hartford, which um, this is actually a family business for us. So my father has been a real estate developer um, in Hartford and particularly in Parkville where he and my mother actually grew up and I grew up going to church and our butcher and our local Portuguese uh, bakery. Um, you know, he has been in the neighborhood working and living uh, for for over 40 years and um, and so he knows he knows the neighborhood pretty well and we still bumped up against many challenges, um, many, um, many efforts to uh, help people understand what we were trying to do. And I'm excited um, to get into that. But um, it really all started with this vision that he had um, to create a community hub, a shopping destination, and a place where folks from the neighborhood to those passing through on 84 on their travels to those in other parts of Connecticut could come to explore all of the cultural beauty that um, Hartford and the surrounding areas have. Um, and we were very focused on showcasing food and retail concepts that are diverse, but authentic to our, our surrounding towns and, and the city of Hartford. And it was really important to us that, that everything be local um, and that that was a driving force for the authenticity we knew we needed to have to be successful um, where we are. Uh, when we were um, 
trying to evangelize the idea of this market in, in the Parkville neighborhood of Hartford, which I'm not sure how familiar everyone is with Hartford or this neighborhood in particular, but this was really the center of industry in the city of Hartford. We have the former rubber works factory. We have a Royal typewriter company. We have uh, Colts is right up the street, Colt Firearms Factory. So um, the neighborhood has a lot of residential space, but it also has this pocket of, um, of, of factories that had have been slowly revitalized over the last 30 years. Um, so with the residential and some commercial um, uh, businesses, he really felt there was a need for food, which always brings a community together and adding retail that could create a little mini main street um, in, in a building. Um, so the original plan was to have 45 vendor stalls, uh, about 20 kitchens. Um, so we we have 20 kitchens here on site of two different size kitchens. Um, and then we have the plan was to have three bars, four event spaces, and the market we were looking to capture, as I mentioned, was the, uh, the surrounding uh, neighbors and towns. Um, but we also have about 250,000 cars a day that were, going, that were passing us on I-84. We're off of two exits on Sigourney and the Sigourney and Sisson Avenue exits. Um, they're pretty much equidistant from the market. Um, and this was a pre-COVID traffic, but I hope we're moving back in that direction with folks on the road and going uh, back to work. Um, the building that we are in is a 20,000 square foot um, building, former factory, the Capital City, uh, Capital City Lumber Company. Um, this was a uh, they built houses in the area. The building was built in the early 1900s, and we actually, from our local um, from our local vintage bookshop here, we have pamphlets that they actually passed out and used to sell their services um, originally in the early in the early 1900s. Um, so 20,000 square feet, um, and we it was all one. It was basically one level with the 20 plus foot ceilings. And so uh, part of our construction challenge was actually adding in a mezzanine level. So we'll get to the structural challenges in a minute. But um, the goal was to have about a six to 800 person market capacity. So these were the original plans and the renderings and the drawings were all done um, with this in mind, knowing we were going to try and fit as many restaurants as we could, but giving optionality on the sizing for those restaurants. Okay, you can go to the next slide. Yes. So um, from ladders to lobster rolls, we uh, when this building was vacated in early 2018, its former tenant was the Bishop's Ladder Company. So they stored scaffolding and ladders. And as you can see in this image on the left, they had uh, the bays were stacked and the bays were only used for storage. Um, so this is what the building looked like. Um, we my father previously owned the building and was the uh, was the landlord to the Bishop's Ladder Company. So this is after we cleared everything out um, and started from this, you know, very uh, raw blank space. You can actually see there are um, there are train tracks here right down the middle of where the how they would get the coal from one end of the building to the other um, in in its uh, in its first uh, life. Um, so. Um, we broke ground in 2018, setting out to convert this 20,000 square foot one story warehouse into a multi level market with 20 kitchens and three bars. Um, we truly had to go down to the studs for this building. There were several times in the construction process where we said, wow, it would have been much cheaper and much faster to knock this thing down and start from scratch. Um, at, at one point in another photo, you'll see we actually had um, uh, we actually had supports holding up the walls from the inside and the outside while we built um, the structural columns to support the second level um, and, and the st structure that we were adding in. Um, so we were uh, funded through private investment. We also received a grant from the Department of Economic Development 
or sorry, the, yeah, the DECD, um, that was around job creation and job retention. And that was secured, you know, well before COVID. And then, um, then the, we received a loan from the CRDA, which this was the first investment of its kind that the CRDA had done with um, a lot, no residential element to the project. So our story was one of firsts, even though the city has had food courts, even though the city has had multi uh, vendor, um, multi vendor uh, spaces. Um, we there were a lot of things we had to work on, you know, for my father, who's been a developer for 30 years uh, that came up in the building process, but also in in the in working with the city and state to uh, bring this dream to fruition. So we uh, ended up having an interesting structural surprise after all of the drawings had been completed. As I mentioned, we're adding a second level. So here you'll see this, all of this scaffolding and scaffold and um, uh, supports on the outside of the building. We're actually holding up the walls while we put, um, while we put the structural elements in place. And what, what you see me pointing at here is our elevator shaft. It was very important to us um, that the this space be completely ADA accessible. Um, and so there are several ways we took that into consideration throughout the design of the building and the spaces in the building. Um, but the elevator shaft was one of the first things we put in. Um, and when the construction management company was digging for the elevator shaft, we found clay um, that they had not found in their initial um, that had not been found in the initial um, found, you know, foundation testing. Uh, and so we were paused like this exact, um, exact amount of progress for about three months while we figured out what we were going to do. We were not going to lose that second level. We were not going to lose the ability to put businesses up there. Uh, and so we worked together with our team to, to find solutions and to find the materials. Um, you know, if, if somebody is working on a project like this today or any construction project, you know, we face those raw materials challenges then. I can only imagine those challenges today. Hopefully things are, um, are improving. Um, so that was one of our first surprises. Um, another thing we bumped up against uh, was really there was no precedent for the liquor and food execution that we wanted to have. You know, our initial plan was to have three different bars run by three different owners who all had their own person, you know, personality and um, you really have that be vendor based, not have it be something that our team, the market management oversaw. Um, we really wanted to be focused on just operations, guest experience, and you know, vendor support and, and management. Um, but you know, my first time working with liquor control, they were absolutely wonderful, but they and they really sat with us and and helped us imagine a way to have our guests walking around with their glass of wine while they picked their food and shopped for um, you know, the local goods that um we we planned to have uh, on our second level um but in the end we actually weren't able to execute on our original plan of bringing in um bar owners here we ended up assuming the liquor license for the entire building and ultimately um property as we go through our expansion so i we quickly went from you know real estate developers to landlords to bar owners um so we've we've had to wear a, a few different hats that we didn't anticipate having to wear, but owning and controlling the liquor as part of our food hall, this is going to be very different from for a public market likely. Um, that has been a real a key to our ability to program the space and drive traffic around, you know, folks that are looking to enjoy um, activities in the evening and on the weekends as well. Um, another challenge uh, and opportunity was really communicating the vision to our neighbors, to the city, uh, to the state, um, and to our prospective restaurants. Um, you know, this 
we got a lot of, um, oh, it's like Faneuil Hall, or how is this different from a food court in a mall? Uh, and we were really looking to build something different, something that that didn't, it, 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 it wasn't a commercialized, it had an authentic, um, it had an authentic energy uh, where the restaurants and our guests were the most, the, were the focal point of everything. We program around our guests and what they want to see, what they want to do. They want to bring their children on Saturdays. So how do we meet those needs? Um, but when your precedents in the state are, you know, Faneuil Hall, or maybe somebody's been out to Pike's Market in, um, in Seattle or, um, uh, to Chelsea Market in, in New York. Um, that wasn't exactly what we were trying to build, but those were sort of our, um, those were sort of our uh, examples in this, in this scenario. Uh, I found, which was very surprising, I spent the last uh, 10 years working in New York and prior to that studying in Washington, D.C., where in both cities these concepts are um, quite common and, and definitely had a boom in the last five years, um, was, was translating this opportunity for restaurant owners and businesses in the, in the local area. In, in Hartford, when we started this project in 2018, there really was not a lot of fast casual dining. Um, and these food halls are really geared towards fast casual. It's a great opportunity for a fast casual business. Um, so we, it, this is this view that you have here is what I had to show people for two years while they tried to envision being uh, being a business, being a restaurant um, in in Parkville Market, in Parkville Hartford, which most of them had never been to before. Uh, so it required a lot of imagination, some really great renderings, um, and you know, spirited conversations on this gravel floor, um, trying to help, trying to um, communicate our vision and our passion for this project. Um, so even those restaurants that are uh, happily here today, or you know, email us looking for space today. Um, you know, in those days, it was it was hard for them to imagine, um, you know, standing and walking through this building. Lastly, I've never opened a food hall. I've never opened a food hall. I've never opened one in Hartford and I've never opened one in a pandemic until May of 2020. So um, construction completed throughout the pandemic. Um, we pushed through however we could. We were pretty much done, um, but there were just finishing touches. Um, and then, you know, we started to let our, our signed on vendors know that we were planning on opening. And a lot of them got spooked. Those who were gonna buy their own kitchen equipment, all of a sudden, you know, their current restaurants had been closed for two months or only doing takeout with Uber Eats losing 30% of that revenue. So, you know, we really had to shift gears. Um, but in the end, I think it's actually really defined what how we are as a market and what we mean to our community. So I'll get into that a little bit more in the next slide. Right. So pivoting is our new normal. We um, for the last year and a half have just been pivoting. Sometimes I really have to stop and remember what we intended to do with this project before um, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and, you know, we're always weighing, um, we're always weighing what is best for our guests and what's best for our restaurants and trying to go, you know, there, I was saying this to somebody the other day, we often say, oh, we can't wait until everybody's back downtown. That is going to be such a game changer for us. Um, and a few, um, a few months ago, I just told our whole team and I've been saying it to our restaurants as well is we have to create our new normal. And new normal is that not everybody is ever gonna come back to downtown Hartford again and be going out to get their lunches. So, you know, that's a reframing and refocusing we had to do even after a booming summer where we saw over 100,000 visitors um, in the month of July and 100,000 in the month of June. So we're constantly 
you know, being a year and a half old and trying to be a community space, uh, we're constantly struggling with what's authentic when, you know, we don't have a, a history yet. We're building our history now. So we opened May 2020. We were one third full. We had six vendors out of 20 kitchens. Uh, we were only, we opened as soon as we were able to do outdoor dining. Um, so we actually, in the, in the, um, architectural phase, uh, my father really pushed to have these service windows that each kitchen, you have your guest facing, when you have your guest facing counter, which is towards the center of the building and on towards the outside of the building, towards our patios, you have like a service window. I call it like a little Dairy Queen window. So they can really take orders from both sides. They can take orders from outside and inside. And in the beginning, it was a thought, the thought was it would be a way for them to do double the volume, right? If we're super busy outside, nice day, people are on the patio, or they just want to grab their lunch quickly. They place their order online, grab and go. But in the pandemic, it was a total game changer for us. Nobody had to come inside. Uh, every, all the vendors who were with us could take their orders from their service window and um, hand them through the, the window. Um, and we also um, had tables outside so they could sit out there. Very limited bar service. Um, and another thing that I actually didn't put here is because of those restaurants that were uh, their fin financial position had changed from when we were talking to them, you know, three months prior. Uh, we actually doubled down our commitment to our partnerships with our restaurants and we furnished the equipment um, for kitchen equipment for those restaurants. So hoods were installed for every single stall, um, but for those who could no longer make the commitment to um, purchasing their own kitchen equipment, we purchased that equipment for them so that they could open with us in May. Um, and as it stands today, we have purchased the equipment for about 90, 90%, 85% of our restaurants that operate here. So um, I missed a step here, but so we opened May of 20, uh, May of 2020, we were one third full outdoor service. Then, you know, six weeks later, the governor opened up indoor dining at 50%. So we scrambled to get enough tables to open indoors. Um, and then we were fully rented by December of 2020. Um, it was a whirlwind and our sales team did an excellent job, but that was a really exciting um, and delightful um, surprise. And it really, in a time of challenge, it gave us the um, confidence to know that, that this was something that businesses were, were looking for and needed. Um, so another change we made um, right upon opening was we have 20 stalls upstairs that are were supposed to be for retail businesses, and we actually converted them into little dining rooms. So we for we um, passed on the opportunity to have retail upstairs so that we could make our seating footprint inside as as large as possible during the pandemic. Now we will slowly start to convert those over to retail stalls and food stalls for businesses that do not require hoods. Um, we also repositioned a coffee shop in an international market that we ran ourselves several times, moving it from space to space, trying to find the right um, location for it. Um, and one thing we started in the very beginning was entertainment and programming. We want somebody to have, we want our customers to have something to do here every single day of the week. And then we want them to celebrate big events with us as well. So this is something we've um, invested in throughout the entire time we've been open. And I think it's really made it, us stand out to our, uh, to our guests um, and, and to um, our neighbors. Lastly, I'll say that you know, the main goal for our team and for me and my father have been to lead with authenticity, availability, and stoicism. It's not um, inexpensive for our vendors or for us to be open until 10 p.m. on Thursday night or to have opened on Monday when nobody's working downtown. You know, we had to spend weeks and months building habits and consistency around our availability for customers 
so that they could trust and believe we would be open when they wanted to visit us. Um, and that is, it has paid off in that we, even in December when um, Omicron was rampant and came through very quickly through everybody's holiday season, we were busier in December than we were in November. And January was busier than December. And now February is busier than January. And it's that consistency that we try to remind our restaurants you know they if they're at their other location they can close early if they want they can be closed for the snowstorm but here are guiding policies as tenants and business partners of ours are that we have consistent hours about 90 percent of the time because customers don't want to come here and see 75 percent of the restaurants closed they don't want to see lights off they don't want to see people taking out the trash when they're trying to do karaoke uh, at the bar so it's a commitment that our vendors make up front and it, it is part of being a part of the team here but we see the trust in from our customers when they came back during some of the most vulnerable times you know we had seen since march of 2020. okay so what's next um so we are really working on growing our footprint on our property it's four acres and we have three other buildings and so we're expanding to um, be a food campus not just a food hall so um, we are working on putting in an entertainment space more kitchens and um, growing our bar footprint as well as possibly bringing in some other activities um, we are super focused on growing and training our team um, the team the operations team is absolutely everything and that when you have a strong operations team they can co-build a strong team amongst you and your restaurants and your vendors um we're also further refining our agreements uh with our you know vendors we've learned a lot over the last year and a half um and we're learning a lot from them um the project for public spaces conference i cannot um say enough how incredible that was i went in 2019 in london and it was a complete game changer for our organization everybody's so willing to share and um, collaborate there it was you know we visited a market that we met there after the fact and they shared a lot of helpful information so um but and then lastly we just continue to listen to our guests and our team members because I always say we are a space for the community so while we had a vision when we started this people come here they experience it they internalize it and then they tell us what they want to see so we have to be authentic to our vision but at the end of the day we're serving a population um, without our guests without their interest and without their love of being here we don't have a business so um, that is something, keeping your ear to the ground and having a great team that is as excited um, for your mission as you are and as invested as your restaurants are is, is extremely important. Um, so that's all I have. Any questions later, I can, I can answer them. Thank you for listening. This really is one of my favorite things to talk about. So I look forward to hearing any questions in the future. Thank you so much, Chelsea. That was excellent. Um, let's move on to our second guest speaker. We have Jennifer Valentino Rodriguez, the formerly the Director of Planning and Development of, at the Town of Windsor Locks, where she worked on this project, and now she is at the Town of Bloomfield. Um, so with that, Jennifer, please take it away. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. And I wanted to uh, say to Chelsea, I love the tagline of ladders to lobster rolls. I think we can all identify with that. I really love that you mentioned a couple of things. Identifying the need of the community. Uh, that's what a lot of us work on is trying to figure out what it is that our community is telling us that they need and then trying to find a way to provide that. Uh, but also the second thing is those great renderings because without those creative visuals, it's really hard to um, build that conversation and build that buy-in for these projects. Uh, you can go ahead to the next slide. Thank you. 
So the public market for Windsor Locks was in the context of bringing the train station back to the downtown. Right now in Windsor Locks, the train station is on the southern part of town. It's surrounded by floodplain and highway. The opportunity to develop there and connect there is not great. It's not connected to any uh, transportation or uh, other options for transportation. It's not connected to housing and so essentially not connected to people. So the idea of bringing the train station downtown, this was something that the community was working on in the early 2000s and uh, during the 2008 Main Street study. That was the major recommendation of that study. Uh, the buy-in for that took years. Um, and here we are trying to develop a vision for everything around that train station. The train station is slated to start construction later this year. And so in the bottom of this slide, you'll see a, a grade area and then to the right of that parking. That is the area of the new train station. Yes, thank you. And uh, the idea for the public market really came out of some of those studies um, in 2008. It looks like this slide isn't coming up completely. Could you forward? Okay, so we'll, we'll stick here for a minute. And then before we um, switch to the next slide, it looks like the text isn't coming up for some reason. Um, so let's go back. There we go. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, what was on the previous slide, just in terms of uh, what, okay, we're forwarding again. <laughs> go back, if you can go back two slides, please. Sorry, it looks like there's a delay. Do you want the, 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 <laughs> yeah. the map, the map? Yep, the map. Okay, I apologize, moment. sorry. That's okay, <laughs> it's doing some funny things. Okay, great. So uh, you, what you can see here is a sequence of development around the train station. Right now, all of the uses in this area are single story suburban style. And as happened in many of our downtowns during urban renewal, the Main Street wall was removed with all good intention, but what was replaced there was single story suburban. Uh, uses which really changed the architecture and the sense of place for our downtowns. So in trying to recreate that, we have this public market um, proposed as part of the vision. We have mixed use buildings um, on both the east and west sides of the property. And you can even see uh, there's a, a reddish uh, rectangle that kind of goes um, north-south here. Um, where it says C, letter C, that's actually two parallel culverts uh, that they were looking to daylight and handle stormwater um, and then be able to redevelop around those. So you can see it's kind of a complex area, um, but we thought that uh, after a lot of community engagement, um, something needed to happen here that was not just residential, not just your typical commercial, um, but would bring something extra special in with increased vibrancy. So now we can go to the next slide. Great, thanks. So after listening to the, to the community, um, identifying some needs, which were lack of commercial space, um, even with redevelopment, we would still not have a great deal of commercial space for new businesses um, and lack of food resources. In Windsor Locks, there is not a large grocery store. Only recently did a small grocery and produce uh, store open up. So a lot of people in the downtown were using the local Valero gas station for nutrition. The options there are not great. And then certainly you can get in a car and go out of town, but for those who need um, or choose to use bicycle or on foot, uh, the options were really limited. So uh, after a number of workshops with the community and with potential small businesses and vendors and local farms, they came up with this mission statement. The mission of the Connecticut River Valley Public Market at Windsor Lock Station is to create a powerful regional engine for economic, community, and agricultural development that takes advantage of Windsor Lock's history, their 
the historic location adjacent to the Windsor Locks Canal and the Connecticut River and its position as a key rail stop between Hartford and Springfield and the home of the second largest airport in New England. Okay, you can forward that slide, please. So just kind of to recap and give a little bit of the history of um, in 2008, the Main Street study was completed and that's where I uh, mentioned that the recommendation to bring the train station back downtown, um, that was the number one recommendation. And so a lot of the future visioning happened around that relocation. In 2013, uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission, uh, they commissioned a transit-oriented development study. And um, through that, a number of recommendations came um, in terms of what types of uses might happen there, what the roadway would look like, and what future sequence of development would look like. And from there was a really strong uh, push to bring back food resources and bring back vibrancy in the downtown. That lack of food resources kept coming up. In 2019, uh, the idea sharing and workshops continued. Uh, we had um, our first selectman at the time was doing lots of traveling and with this um, interest in bringing food resources back down to the downtown, um, attempts at having farmers markets um, in multiple seasons. Uh, this, this idea really uh, popped up through those conversations um, to create a public market. And then in 2019, uh, we had a number of things happen. The town of Windsor Locks created a TIF district and a micro loan program. And so through those conversations, um, the, you know, the realization of doing a feasibility study uh, became a reality. We had a funding source through the TIF district to reinvest in the area. And so that funding allowed this feasibility study to happen. The consultants we were working with to create the, the public market they were skeptical. They said, you know, Windsor Locks is a small community. A lot of the towns around it have lower populations um, in terms of numbers, in terms of people that might support the market. And when they were comp completing the feasibility study, they were uh, very pleasantly surprised. And, and so was the community that drawing from city to city, from Springfield to uh, the city of Hartford, the numbers looked great. And so we decided to move forward with a business plan um, and create that mission statement that I just read on the last slide. So you can go ahead and forward slide. Uh, the components of the business plan included a summary of the feasibility study, benefits of the public market, that mission space statement that we uh, spoke about and a market name and how important creating that name would be, uh, the types of architecture, interior considerations, uh, wayfinding, exterior uses and site plan, management plan and tenant leasing, the types of sale and competition, uh, the local economic impact. Um, you know, one of those things when it comes to economic impact, it's interesting. A lot of people said, are, you know, are these things profitable? And the message that was clear to us is, well, you'll probably make back as much as you spend, but that's not the idea. The idea is to provide a resource and then have the local economic impact speak for itself. Um, operating and capital budgets and then fundraising recommendations. So you can go ahead and forward to the next slide. So um, before I go through these bullets, I just wanted to mention that um, because of the location of the public market, we knew that we would have to have continued coordination with the Connecticut DOT. Uh, the consultant said this market doesn't really work. It doesn't really happen unless it's as close as possible to the train station. So you have the people that are using transportation, um, using this public market, you have all of the people who live in the downtown using this market, and this is where it works. So the coordination efforts are really important. And then it's just some interesting bullets here. Uh, the Connecticut River public market at full occupancy is likely to create roughly 400 new direct jobs and 1,000 total new jobs, including direct, indirect, and induced. And then number two is total net annual income and constant dollars 
is 1,162,755. Main market building approximately would be 26,000 square feet. And then obviously kiosk space outside and food trucks, you wanna activate both the interior and exterior. There's even some talk about how the roof gets used uh, because that would be walkable from a connection with the train station. And then the total operating expenses would be expected at 1,161,639. So you can see how close those numbers are. And really you're focusing on the, the uh, resources that this provides to the community. You're focusing on the no number of jobs that are generated and the number of new businesses this allows uh, to be created as well as other local economic impacts. So you can go ahead and forward. Uh, so this is the information here. I know that um, we were hoping to wrap up before 11 so that questions could happen. This is a really broad um, overview and I'm glad to answer any questions that you have. Or if you wanted to reach out to myself or the um, author of the business plan and feasibility study or the architect and planner that worked with us, I've listed their information there. I really appreciate that you gave me some time to talk about this today. Thank you. Thank Thank you so much, Jennifer. I am going to stop sharing real quick as we have a few minutes now for Q and A. Um, so, with that, um, if Chelsea, if you can come back on, and Jennifer, you stay on. I'm going to try to pin both of you here. Um, so, uh, as as you guys come up with questions for Jennifer uh, for her um, aspect of the of the presentation, we got some for you, Chelsea. Um, so, first, what mechanisms did you use to recruit uh, your vendors? Uh, it's we're we're still in the process, right? Because our um, a handful of our license agreements are only a year. Um, so we use a lot of social media. That was our main channel in the beginning um, and actually physically going and visiting restaurants that we thought would be a good fit here at the market uh, and creating the variety that we needed to create. So reaching out to great brands and local businesses on social media, visiting them in person, that goes a very, very long way to share your interest and investment in, in them being a part of, of your market. And then, you know, now we have our website, we have an intake form there, and we get a lot of applications, um, but we've also learned a lot about what makes Parkville market a good fit for certain businesses. So that intake form is really helpful in, um, in you know, setting up the conversation with prospective restaurants. Thank you. Um, Jennifer, there was a question here for the job creation numbers. Can you provide examples of the job types for each direct, indirect, and induced? Sure. So some of the examples were um, they they talked a little bit about what happens in the building. Obviously, um, marketing was a big one. Um, uh, operations positions, um, any type of um, grounds and ma maintenance were included. Um, the small businesses that would be generated were included. Uh, but then they also talked about things like um, you know people that might be needed for things like deliveries, um, other uh, staff that were engaged maybe through um, the construction itself. So maybe those temporary types of jobs. So it really was very broad. Excellent. Yeah. And, and Chelsea, actually, we got a couple of questions that are kind of in the same vein. You know, can you speak to kind of, um, there's a question on who does the booking of events and maintaining the calendar and also, you know, how many employees does Parkville Market have? Oh, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry, that had to happen at least once today, right? Yes. Um, so it honestly has varied. We opened with myself, which is director of operations, a general manager, and somebody who oversaw marketing, sales, and, um, and events. So um, from our perspective, we and, and sort of the position we were in when we opened, everybody was a multi-hyphenate. We added a, an assistant 
general manager and we didn't even have a bar manager until November of 2020. So, um, you know, certain funding options might allow people to have larger staffs. Um, you know, the way we started, it really meant everybody understood sort of everything from the ground up, which was really helpful in having to expand our hours of operations, having coverage when, you know, someone was pregnant and out on maternity leave. So, I mean, in I came from working at a startup, so I like to operate the market as a startup. Um, but in the last six months, we've added some really crucial operations positions um, in sort of like a shift supervisor role, which really allows us to open and close the building every day without incident from people who have been trained by our operations team. And that was a real game changer for us in terms of creating consistency, not only for our team members, for our our team, for our guests, uh, for our maintenance and grounds crews, but um, also for our vendors to make sure they always know and have a familiar face as to who can help them, you know, when there's a challenge. Because even though they run their own business in this building, they rely very heavily on market management to support them. So that was a, a game changer. We have, if, if you include our bar team, we have um about 25 to 30 um, full and part-time team members for the one wow. building we have right now. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of moving pieces and moving parts here. <laughs> um, we're, we're getting close to the top of the hour, so I want to ask um, both of you guys uh, maybe two last questions. Um, there was a question about um, food, um, food waste policy and things like that. And I'm curious, you know, Chelsea, how you guys are um, looking at that, but just in general about sustainability, is that something, um, you know, to you, Jennifer, as well, that you guys are looking at, uh, you know, for the plan? So Chelsea, if you want to start. Yeah, so we, we want to, um, we started out with a compost bin, but our restaurants were just throwing um, trash in the compost. So it, um, and, and with the expansion of number of restaurants hitting our volume stride um, in May of last year, it's something we had to scale back on because it was doing more, uh, you know, damage on the composting side. Everything that was being composted was not able to actually go to compost. So we are going to revisit that. And um, we, one thing I'll say is we started out working with a big company through, um, through All Waste. And there is a local company uh, called Blue Earth Compost, I believe, um, in the neighborhood. And so if I went, when, when we go back to this, which I hope is soon, um, I think we'll go with the local um, sort of higher touch uh, version. It's hard to figure out. Customers don't comp don't compost, right? So it takes that floor staff to be like helping and really guiding them and sharing why it's important and almost like a brand ambassador of, you know, recycling and waste management. So it's, it's a little more people heavy than um, you would, you might think. Jennifer, I don't know if you guys are thinking about that as well. Yeah, sure. So the, um, although the plan might touch on it, there are hundreds of pages in there, so I'm not positive, but um, the you know, the plan for us is uh, much more broad. We don't have those level of details um, written out, but I would say that the um, town of Windsor Locks right now is looking at that with our Department of Public Works because waste in general and recycling is such a big conversation right now with some of our facilities in Connecticut closing and having to um, deliver out of state. Um, we have, and I know a lot of the communities here have uh, sustainable CT teams and are working with other local, local organizations to um, bring these efforts forward in all of the ways that we operate in the community, as many as possible. Um, so that's where the conversation is right now with the Sustainable CT team and the Department of Public Works in general on how, um, what our options are for handling waste. Uh, so I can see that conversation, um, you know, mixing into this as it goes forward. And, you know, so in Windsor Locks right now, it's a matter of, you know, looking at partners, looking at development partners, um, trying to engage people with interest, um, you know, a private public partnership perhaps, uh, but also looking at funding, um, you know, whether it's uh, the DECD, um, uh, potentially the USDA, 
and the Bureau of Transportation federal programs. Um, so that's where they're at right now. Excellent. Chelsea, Jennifer, thank you so much for being with us this morning. This You guys presented great information. Um, very excited to see the future of Parkville Market and the market in Windsor Locks. It's very exciting. Um, if there are any other questions that come through, you know, you can send them to us and perhaps we can we can ask Chelsea and Jennifer to, to give their input. Um, so with that, I'm just going to wrap up real quick here. Um, and to remind you that Connecticut Main Street is a network of uh, professionally managed downtowns and neighborhood districts and municipal planning and economic development departments. Um, and we encourage you to reach out and become a member. Also, we have a professional affiliate membership for um, industry professionals. Um, please visit our website, ConnecticutMainStreet.org, for a library of our past archived webinars, directory of our professional affiliates, and our small business library that provides some great business advice for your merchants. And with that, thank you again to all of our sponsors and program partners. Thank you for all of our attendees. And again, huge shout out to Jennifer and Chelsea for being our guest speakers today. And we will see you next time. Thanks, guys. Bye.